we'll give him five. Everybody move in, move in. adjustment, the exhibition will now be submerged. The walls have been set to a height of two meters in anticipation of rising waters. Visitors unable to swim can collect inflatable life jackets at reception. Visibility may be compromised by murky waters. We are advised that this should not affect engagement with artworks. En raison d'un ajustement technique, l'exposition sera désormais submergée. Les murs ont été scellés à une hauteur de 2 mètres en prévision de la montée des eaux. Check, 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 check. Les visiteurs et visiteuses qui ne savent pas nager peuvent récupérer des gilets de sauvetage gonflables à la réception. La visibilité peut être compromise en un trouble. Cela ne devrait pas nuire à la rencontre avec les œuvres d'art.
Yes. Uh, hello, and welcome to the talk with Info Unlimited at Bring the Flowers to the Theater here at Sarah's Gallery. Uh, welcome. Hello. So we're just going to get started now. Um, I'm here today with a, I think everybody knows each other, uh, but I'm here today with a longtime friend, Reese Cox. Hi there. Um, Reese, where did you and I meet? That's a question I've asked myself many times, and I actually have no idea. Um, it very well could have been at a Savage Weekend, a long-running uh, festival in North Carolina, in Carbro, North Carolina, um, that many friends have kind of made pilgrimages to over the years. Um, but uh, if not there, then maybe it's some some uh, small dark basement in Bushwick ten, 10 years ago. I think it was... Maybe at the hose, actually. I think it was uh, the hose, for sure. Or maybe fitness. Um, Reese, I, I'm really glad you're here. Thank you for making the trek all the way from Berlin, because before you be were here. a Berliner, you were a stalwart of the East Coast, do-it-yourself, subcultural, uh, electronic music uh, contingent. Um, but you've always been more than just a musician um, and really sort of emblematic of the kind of things that in this show I'm really interested in um, fostering and developing, which is the kind of person that makes work that sits somewhere in a music space, somewhere in a visual space, and um, allows their, their practice to sort of flourish in that gray zone. Um, so it's, it's, it's excellent to have you here. Um, while we did meet in that context, tell us a little bit about, I guess, your, your experiences uh, generally relating to creativity as a person who grew up in the South. And creativity is like a silly word maybe, but you know. Well, I can start by saying that I'm uh, unashamed of the word creativity. It seems like a lot of <laughs> artists have. It seems like a lot of artists have maybe sort of a, a hang-up, as it sounds sort of cheesy or or even you know uh, infantile or something. But I think you know, at least recently, I've uh, let go of any attempt of making like intellectually driven or smart work, um, and maybe that's how I've kind of arrived. Not only doing the label on the radio, but also the work that I've been making recently is is allowing. Uh, intuition to speak first, making first and asking questions later. Um, and that's kind of how I've, in the kind of context in, wi in which um, you and I met each other. I mean, my background has been in visual arts from a young age. Um, and somewhere along the line, I started making music. Um, and music was, uh, was decisively a space where decisions were not uh, preconceived, calculated, um, justified. You know, it was a place of pure action or, you know, you could say creativity. Um, and studying art, you know, especially when you're young, it, 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 be it can become quite loaded. So music was sort of an outlet um, where visual art couldn't be. And, but at a certain point, I mean, over, over many years, and I mean, also you, you talked about doing that in the South, like there, I'm lucky, I didn't know much about it when I was younger, but over the years I kind of came to learn that a lot of people were operating in this kind of mode in, this, in my home state of North Carolina that there was this sort of scene or community um, which I later became you know, familiar with and close with a lot of the people in it uh, that were operating very much in their own world and in their own context. And that is sort of where I you know, kind of came of age um, and learned a, an artistic and creative language that I feel still massively informs what I do. I mean, I mentioned to you, when, you, when we have in our early conversations about this show and this project, that when I was younger, feeling sort of frustrations with this smaller scene, that I always thought like, oh, I'll eventually I'll grow out of this underground world and I'll be a real artist. Um, but it, it just continues to be the case that like this, that's sort of a false idea, you know, that um, that's sort of the source of, you know, inspiration and, and you know, wellspring of, of creativity that I continue to draw from and the freedom that that sort of 
had is something that I use as kind of a beacon for how I try to work now. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, transitioning now, talking about sort of the label and the radio project, uh, in 2018, I um, was asked, uh, I was living in Berlin at this point, and I was asked by someone from Kashmir Radio to do a talk show, um, sort of an open invitation. What I ended up making was a show called Info Unlimited, uh, where I, <coughs> where I was speaking with artists who um, are very much working in sort of visual arts context and within that sort of history, but they're using sound as the primary medium. Um, um, and this to me was quite appealing because at this point I'd been making music for a long time, but as music became less of something that I did in a sort of like isolated community and it became more of a profession, I found myself feeling very out of place and frustrated. Um, kind of with the wrong, I was like, I'm in the wrong place. You know, like I don't really, I don't foresee a future doing music in this way that I feel satisfied with, you know. Um, why? Why? I think the, I think the, the difference in kind of language, you know, I mean, this is something you and I have talked about for years now, um, you know, going into the studio and making music, but ultimately coming at it with the background that is not explicitly music. You know, I know for you, relational aesthetics is a, is a major uh, sort of point of inspiration and reference in the way that you think about how music can facilitate kind of community exchange. Um, and for me, I mean, like, you know, I spend so much time reading about the lives of, of painters or conceptual artists and thinking about their practice and, you know, drawing cues from that place. Um, but I've just for so long gone into the studio making music because at a certain point those became my primary tools. So when the radio program began, I sort of wanted to venture into that, lean into that more and, and speak to artists who have made that their primary medium um, and have done so in a way which doesn't fit comfortably in either kind of monolithic category of you know, plastic or, or sonic uh, arts. Um, and you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but over the course of the years that I had the radio program, which I've decided recently is now over, and there's a new radio program, I'll talk about that later, um, I was sort of, you know, speaking to artists that I was maybe sort of envious of, people that had found a way of approaching a kind of, or, or d m having a kind of practice and working in a way that I wanted to do but didn't know how to, you know. I mean, the idea of, uh, you know, an artist like you know Florian Hecker, who I've looked up to for a long time, is incredibly foreign. If you're coming from you know North Carolina, uh, there's just no context for something like that. And thinking like, okay, somewhere out in the world, this exists, um, and I want to know what it is, you know, and how that's possible. Is it that the contexts don't exist, or is that the contexts are not easily accessible? Um, I mean, it's mostly a matter of access. You know, finding finding such things on the internet. Um, or seeing exhibitions, you know, very kind of un under very rare, to me, very rarefied circumstances, thinking like, and maybe just sort of being young and almost kind of like throwing stones at this thing that you want because you don't know what it is, but you want to, you just have an attraction to it, so you just, you're persistent, you know. Um, so over the course of the radio program, I had, I've had opportunities to partner with various institutions and galleries and speak with the speak with artists like this, um, you know, over the course of twenty or, or twenty eighteen until twenty twenty one, or last year twenty twenty two, and um, I guess that was a way for me, without immediately realizing it, to understand how such practices can be in the world and how people arrive at such practices, um, where they can exist, how they can exist. Um, and, uh, you know, in doing this, you know, some of these people became friends and even mentors to some extent. And uh, I wanted to work with them for to a, with a lar in a larger capacity outside of just doing these sort of radio interviews. Um, and so I started the label. Um, and so far, the artists that I've released on the label are just two, with Kristen Oppenheim uh, and Niall Cotting with uh, Nozomu Matsumoto. And the next release will be with uh, Marina Rosenfeld. Um, all three are very different artists, um, but they all work with sound and doing exhibition um, and all have uh, very, very specific practices which have, interestingly, in their own, s in, their in, in, in each of them have faced challenges of 
you know, Mar Marina talks about this most bluntly of like really having to insist on making a place in the world for that work to exist. You know, she said something to me recently where she was, she, she teaches and she said, you know, when I, when I graduated from CalArts in the 90s, there was really nowhere for me to do what I was doing, so I had to invent it and has been doing it sort of since then. Um, and uh, that, I guess that's sort of left me with an answer to this sort of question that I began with, of like where, do, where does this kind of work exist? Like where does such a practice exist? If it doesn't fit comfortably in a professionalized and industrialized music s scenario, and if the kind of uh, normal or familiar sort of uh, economy of, of, you know, the quote art world uh, isn't necessarily always uh, very welcoming to such a practice, how do you navigate this in a life, essentially? Um, and, you know, I think that the label, the attempt was to think about these pieces, you know, specific pieces that I felt particularly drawn to, an artist practice that I felt particularly drawn to, um, a way to not only kind of carry the conversation further, but to make records specifically as in the language that they're spoken about, the way that the packaging is presented, what we do with them at for the release events. Uh, we do exhibitions instead of concerts or something like this. Um, to talk about them as catalogs for artworks in the way that you might have like a, a, a retrospective of a sculptor or a painter and you might have like a, a museum catalog after the fact, but these are records uh, that often come with, with writing or documentation of the works. Um, and, you know, in the case of Kristen Oppenheim, the first, which is the first release, uh, we had an exhibition in Zurich of works which hadn't been exhibited together in that way, you know, in 30 some years. And that was a process of, the whole release took over, took almost two years to get together because it was a matter of digitizing these tapes, you know, these tapes which had been purchased by museum collections in the 90s and almost no one had heard since then, but feeling like this is work which feels quite contemporary and, you know, there should be an audience which has access to this work. Um, and it was a matter of a long time speaking to her galleries and kind of gaining their trust and getting permission to use these works. And she said something really interesting as we were first starting to, w when we first met actually, which we met purely circumstantially, um, I met her and I was like, oh my God, you're Kristen Oppenheim, I'm such a big fan. And she was kind of startled and she was like, who the hell are you? Like, what's, what do you mean you're a big fan? Um, and, uh, you know, I met with her on the first meeting and I was telling her, oh yeah, like there's this sort of small underground scene and everybody like has a tape label and like you can release music really easily. And she's like, oh, that sounds like so amazing. Like it's such, it's so boring when like, Little does she know. Yeah, she's like, it's so boring, you know, you know, when your music is just locked up in like MoMA collections. And I was like, oh yeah, like grass is definitely rough stuff. definitely greener <laughs> on the other rough side. Stuff. But she ultimately had a point. I mean, she had made this work, which at a period of time, you know, the the powers that be in the art world in the '90s, you know, um, uh, really, she had a lot of really big shows at that time, and the work was collected. But because it doesn't have or partially because it doesn't have a clear visual reference, once it goes away, it really goes away. Once these tapes are in storage, yeah. they're not, I mean, you know, they have little sound bites on UbuWeb, but that's, that was kind of it up until recently. Sound has this uh, inherently revelatory, emancipatory capacity. It's accessible within the realms of your ability to hear, but, but beyond that even feel. And so there is this like s strange duality that occurs, I guess, when is locked away. Yeah. What is the point? Mm -hmm. Like at its cru at the core of itself, you know, it's uh, at the crux of it. It's a bit difficult. Um, I want to go back though, because we we're off to the we're off to the races here. Um, I want to talk to you about why a, why a label and why a physical media label. Since I've known you, uh, you have like a really stringent practice that sort of relates to me, like. You, you're a tactile individual. You used to build synths. I remember seeing sequencers that you made from kits. I've watched you paint in an extremely methodical manner. Um, and now these additions, they exist, and they're numbered individually, et cetera. These are the additions that you see on the walls here. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess, like, why now taking these and doing it in this particular manner, as opposed to um, 
having it free online in a library that you would create or something like that, you know? Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I, I say this as someone who loves records very much. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll start off by saying that I didn't know it was such a pain in the ass to have a label. <laughs> and if I knew that, I don't know if I would have done it. Um, yeah. But, I mean, you know, first addressing that question, I think, you know, when you... you Going off to what I was saying, what, what, what Marina said about really kind of insisting for a place for your work or the kind of work you like to exist, this was sort of a way to do that. Thinking like, okay, well, this is work that deserves um, such a catalog. You know, these are pieces which I feel deserve um, this, you know, to be made in such an official manner um, and to be given very proper exhibitions and to be given, you know, and no one else is doing it. And I feel like anytime you, you feel uh passionately and i'm not afraid of the word passion just as not i'm not, I'm not afraid of the word creativity if you feel passionately about that and no one's picking up the slack then maybe you have a responsibility to do it um and it creates like a middle ground right you know like with the additions they're limited but then they're not vaulted away entirely you yeah. know and it strikes strikes a firm balance so right yeah. i mean moving into my own practice now which only you know i feel like for the longest time i was trying to think how do i how do I, I wanted to deliberately pr uh, pivot back into a visual arts practice and it, it became immediately clear to me that it, I shouldn't just disregard, you know, you know, all the things that I've done throughout my adult life that have got me to this point. Um, like I said earlier, like I realized that it wasn't a matter of graduating from the underground sensibility and becoming like a, uh, you know, a uh, fine artist or something. I, th I thought, well, this is, this has been the, this is the, life that I've lived, and this is the material that I have to work with, this is what I'm familiar with. So moving into making screen prints, you know, initially I started painting and I thought, well, well, the first question is, what do I wanna make paintings of? I mean, I did it so much when I was younger and it's always been an important point of reference, but what is the subject matter that I actually want to use? Um, and through kind of asking this and making a lot of bad paintings in the process, um, which will never see the light of day, um, I somehow landed on the project that I have now, um, where, and I can't, I, can't, I can't give you the full origin story, it's been really kind of an intuitive process. And something that I learned from making music for so long was that a lot of, the, a lot of my favorite work is stuff that I've made kind of on accident. And um, a lot of work that never went anywhere is something that was sort of overly conceived before it ever really got into production. And so I decided very deliberately when, when I decided, okay, I'm gonna start making visual work again, but I'm gonna take that sensibility that I learned in music and sort of make first and ask questions afterwards. The sort of generative kind of jamming thing, I think also is something, and I hate to keep br dragging you back to this place to where we met, um, and, but it, there's this generative kind of jamming, uh, improvisational thing that I think, you know, is what occurs with the prints and the new stuff I've been seeing, but also when I used to see you play, the structures by which you did the work within these limited sequencers, the way that it was, yeah. you utilized the I utility, mean, I, I, yeah. I very much believe in, or maybe not even believe in, I, I think I just gravitate naturally towards a, a way of work and really larger, in a larger sense, like a way of living that uh, does operate within the confines of, you know, strictures. Um, and you know that brings us back to the project that I'm doing now. And for context, um, you know the project that I'm referring to is uh, a, a band. It's funny. I like wanted to wanted to make visual art again, so I started a band. Um, but the band doesn't actually exist. Uh, the band is called Poser, um, and uh, it started because I had sort of a a daydream. I had made all this music over the pandemic, which sounded much like un like much different than anything I'd ever produced. Um, and it kind of sounded like a studio band or something. Um, and I had this sort of daydream of like a concert where between performances, this band came on stage and this music played and there was a whole sort of scene or sonography of a concert, but then no one actually played any instruments. You know, like the stage was really set and, uh, but nothing really happens. That it really was a band that produced an image of a band above all else. And I, it sort of, when, I, when that occurred to me, I thought, oh my gosh, that's, that's such a great, way to approach this, you know, again, with this prob problem of subject matter when wanting to move back into like a visual way of working. Um, you know, 
when I was really young and I start and I was painting, I would, you know, as a teenager, take photographs of my friends and from those sort of like photo sessions would then make artwork out of that. And then suddenly I kind of found an answer. I ha it's like, okay, well I can make this fake band and the driving kind of conceptual framework is that it is a band that first and foremost produces images above music, that the music is kind of a vehicle to facilitate performances, which then produce visual media, which then get rendered into artworks. What I like there too is that, to my understanding thus far is that you're negotiating this really good place between like uh, setting the parameters with the compositions you make, the recordings you make beforehand, but then also being able to relinquish a level of control to allow yep. the performers to create. And so then you're, you're in this dialogue between them, yourself, and then that really speaks to the do and then assess after. You know, uh, I like that a lot. Yeah. It's also difficult for me to surrender that amount of control. Um, for example, tomorrow there's the second poser performance here at 7.30. And um, I... Uh, Everybody should come. Um, and I only know one of the people that's actually going to be in the band tomorrow. The band always has different members and they're always actors. Um, and, uh, you know, like in the first performance, for example, they had guitars that weren't plugged in. You know, they had the kind of like necessary accoutrements just enough to kind of make a gestalt of a concert. Um, but then all the other uh, elements are kind of hollowed out. Um, and I sort of thought, okay, well, these very familiar forms, which exist not only presently, but historically, are something that can be played with and manipulated easily because they're so familiar. Um, and interestingly, a lot of people have said like, wow, it, it seems like you're really making a, uh, a critique of music. And if I am, it's, it's, it's pure happenstance. You know, again, this has been approached like intuitively, so. The people that you're calling from your first performance of this work and then into this one, uh, I would say that in my experience, music, even on a global, you know, sort of zoomed out lens, the participants are out often very, the degrees of separation are rather close. The people that are, you utilize for the performances, typically not people who engender themselves as music, per, you know, music scene participants per se. Yeah, and that's sort of a decisive, that, 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 that was a decision kind of from the beginning. And even coming to this, like approaching this performance, I mean, I'm lucky to have a lot of friends in New York, but I, I needed people who had very specific qualities to some anonymity. some anonymity in there as well, right? It helps, yeah. Um, you know, like there was a, a long list of people I thought of who I thought could do a good job, but they're already too close to the thing that's being referenced. Present. You know? Um, and so it was a little too easy and too close. Um, you know, you know, two, two, two of the people that are in the band tomorrow, like I've never met in person and that like terrifies me, but it also feels kind of liberating, you know? It's great. Yeah. It's great. So we've covered a bunch of ground now in the beginning. Does anybody have any questions from the start or we could save them for later? Why don't we introduce, why don't we do now the listen, some listening okay. now yep, that we've created groundwork? Good. Or is there anything else that we should cover? We can keep this going back and forth. I, I'd love talking to you, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I think maybe listening is good. I can talk a bit about, um, yeah. where, where should we start? Do you want to do an introduction? Yeah, I can do some introductions here. Beautiful. Um, so, well, going back to, you know, the radio program, um, I, I was really lucky from the beginning that, this is sort of a weird thing to say, but the, 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 the pandemic started shortly after I started the radio program, and that meant that a number of, you know, museums and galleries all over the world shut their doors, and, and they were all of a sudden really interested in radio. And for a while, it kind of became like a freelance job to work with, you know, Nottingham Contemporary or DAD, for example, or Haus der Kultur und der Welt to make um, radio programming. And, you know, a lot of the artists that I would love to, to interview but didn't really think that I had access to were suddenly just people that were being proposed. Um, and uh, that sort of meant very quickly being like, okay, well, this project, this is a project that I should take much more seriously. And one of the 
early peop people early on was a um, uh, New York based artist, Marina Rosenfeld, who I referenced earlier. And um, we have, um, we've been working, she was actually the first artist I approached like three or four years ago. And the record just yesterday was finalized. So it was a lot of back and forth and what it's come together in like in a really amazing way. And the piece is one that I'm so excited to be working with. And it's again, one of these things that I'm like, I can't believe nobody's making this record because it's so incredible. Um, this is how the label was supposed to start, right? But yeah, then with, with hers. Right. And I mean, just she's, got rearranged. she's, you know, Kristen didn't have so much going on, so sh she, so we worked together really closely, almost on a daily basis for a long time. Whereas Marina's very busy, so we would put it down for months and then pick it back up, and that's why it took so long. Um, but um, the the record is a project uh, called Greatest Hits, um, and it's been performed a few times. Uh, the first iteration was in the rotunda at the Guggenheim, uh, where she uh, was uh, performing with Greg Fox. Uh, the percussionist, and how this project came about. She had done, and she's worked for years, I mean, for decades at this point, with uh, with dub plates as like a really central fixture in her practice as a mode of, of of sampling and resampling material and keeping it in this in the res in the sort of strictures of this particular medium. Um, and she had had an exhibition, I think, in 2014 or 15, where the dub plates themselves that she'd been using for years would be on view. And you know, typical of kind of Marina's approach, she didn't just want to exhibit them, but she had, she worked with um, someone else to produce uh, a super collider script, which pr which would generate instructions as to which piece should be which which dub plate should be taken off the wall and played by uh, a gallery attendant over the course of the exhibition. And then after this exhibition, there was a sort of long piece of information which she then used as a score and worked with, initially with Greg Fox to, to interpret, like how do we produce rules to read what are basically these instructions. We're gonna decide that these are instructions. Um, and then this piece continued to develop and the record that we have now finished um, is an iteration that was performed at PS1 with uh, Greg Fox and also the percussionist Eli Kessler. Um, and I'm gonna play you the first track off the record and it's not just a recording of the, the concert itself. You know, Marina then took the recordings and, and worked with them further to make something that's you know, specific to this release.
about this record um, and Marina's work generally is that while her work is very different than the rest of the work on the label and my own work, uh, I feel like it really encapsulates um, a sort of logic and sensibility which I feel uh, very strongly drawn to, um, which is, um, you know, as you listen, as you listen, it, it becomes clear over the course of listening to the record that there is a, a driving logic, but it's, but it's one which is highly specific and it has arisen out of um, an ongoing practice. Um, that, you know, it's, yes, 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 it's sort of music, but it comes out of something very specific and very particular and it is, and it is sort of decisively unique to the way that Marina has decided to work over a very long period of time. Uh. I'm taken by the kind of uh, the architecture of it, you know, the 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 the, the space, the spatiality of it, and I'm wondering, like, uh, and if you feel comfortable talking about the way she impl like sort of delegates this this compositionally, like, are the dub plates? Are we talking like lock grooves and like multiple players happening at once, or is yeah, this? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So it. Do you know, like, it's kind of like nerd questions, you know, like, is it a number of record players uh, happening at once? Or Often, yes. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. No, it's wonderful. Yeah, and all the decisions, by the time you arrive at the playing itself, there is some amount of improvisation, but the but most of what's happening is, is following um, the score itself. So all the work kind of happens beforehand, and playing it follows, uh, on the one hand, very strict rules, but rules which have been decided um, by Marina and by Greg and Eli before the actual performance. And they're sort of adhering to that logic uh, as they carry out the performance. I love the, the synth, like the dub, kind of like. Yeah, yeah, I love, nice. I love this kind of sonic palette that Marina has in all of her work. It's fantastic. Um, do you want to play another selection from there or? Uh, that's the only one that I have prepared. I didn't want to play too much because the record cool. isn't out yet. It will be out in a few months. Right. Um, so that's a sneak peek. Um, so immediacy, you've had to really sit with the, so again, like going back now, like the, the process of doing the label is kind of a little bit different than do and then assess because the do is like stretched like taffy over this long, long process. And this might be kind of an airy question or like whatever, you know, whatever, but from the point that you started the label and you've had these kinds of stretches of time in the production phase and sort of whatever comes up as a record goes, I don't think people really realize how insane it is to put out a record at this day and age. Has, has your approach morphed at all or has your relationship to the w recordings morphed at all? Like, I'm just kind of curious, like what's, what, how you've grown in the midst of that like, you know, marked time frame that the production has, uh, you know, occurred? Well, I think the, the, the challenge that I've grown to appreciate is um, what it sort of takes to continue to take something seriously. Um, and, you know, I'll step back a bit to, to talk about what I mean. I, many, many years ago, I spent a summer um, as a studio assistant for Matthew Barney and uh, I think I worked there for like two or three months. And, you know, the studio is enormous and uh, there's many people working there and, you know, he was there every day kind of overseeing everything. And it was, I was just, I had never seen at that point in my life such uh, really kind of unbelievable for me at the time commitment to an idea. You know, I spent months working on one part of one mold for one sculpture um, with an entire team and you know the days were very long and it was everything was done with such surgical precision and i i thought like you know i've been making at that point i had been making art and making music for a long time but i had just never i had never sort of seen someone take their practice to such an extreme and do so and and everything you know the ideas the idea had already been sort of uh, thought out, everything had already been done, you know, the sketches had been made, the planning and everything, and now it was time for execution, and that was my job. Um, but the, the lengths that were gone to, to produce this one piece, that I was just one part of, of the process, in a very long process, uh, something that really stuck with me. So when, 
when approaching these records, you know, and it's just me, and I, I get excited about a project, you know, in the case of Marina, I get excited about a project. And, you know, at a certain point, that enthusiasm wears out, but you've already started. And you realize, like, oh, my God, this is going to be really time-consuming and expensive and complicated, and do I even have time for this? And you think you have to kind of continue to decide, um, yes, I am going to keep doing this because I want this to exist in the world. Um, and I think that maybe that answers your question. I mean, it, it's sort of a, a practice of continuing to wake up and decide that this is important and that you're going to continue to put time into it, especially when you're working. I mean, it's one thing to do it for your own work, and then it's another... I guess this is a bit of a difference between like being an artist or a curator or, or a label owner or whatever. Um, to do it for your own work, it takes one kind of commitment and one kind of sort of confidence, but to do it for s someone else's work takes something slightly different. Um, and I think, you know, it makes me excited when there's an artist whose work I feel really uh, compelled by um, to write to them you know, and I do all the kind of graphic design for the for the artwork for, uh, for the for the artwork for the label and everything. And you know, I get really excited when I email them with good news. You know, because I want them to feel that there is I want I want them to know that their work as is as important to me as as it is. You know, and I want them to also feel like other people are going to be able to see the work in that light once the record comes out. Like that's an experience I want to provide to them. Maybe selfishly because I want people someone to do that for me. You know, to be completely honest. Um, but it gives me like great joy, uh, you know, especially since, you know, I'm, I think it's actually easier working with musicians, like musicians are, are less picky, like working with, with these particular artists to make, to, to make this record the way that they want it takes a long time. Um, so when it actually works and everyone's happy at the end of the day, and so far everyone has been, uh, it's incredibly gratifying for me and it's worth the amount of time that I put into it. Um, I Aside from everything you said about the structures of, you know, your, how you frame out your time, there's something you kind of brought up about the modalities of, you know, and the sort of compartmentalizations of uh, artist, curator. And then, you know, I think something you and I talk a lot about um, is this space that sort of bonds all those things where, and I'm kind of curious what, I mean, you know, you're here today, we're talking about your label where, Ostensibly, you're operating from a curatorial perspective. Tomorrow, you're, uh, you know, doing dramaturgical and, you know, comp comp uh, com you're composing all these works for people to perform on top of. <coughs> Do you see that there's any sort of necessity at this point in history for a differential in those modalities of composer or, you know, sound artist or... Yep. Uh, you know, curator, radio you know, man, you know, it's, right. is, is, it, is it valid at this point? That's kind of one of the overarching questions of the show that I'm trying to. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the, that's the forever question, right? I mean, and that's also been like a big part of our kind of like creative relationship and friendship is having a kind of, you know, our own respective but ultimately mutual interest in that question. Um, and it's one which is never answerable. I mean, I think for a long time before kind of, stepping in, putting myself into the role that I have been of, have, of like being more out in the world with the work that I'm doing, whether it be other people's projects or my own. I was so sort of fixated on like, you know, New York 60s scene or whatever and be like, oh yeah, they broke down all the barriers. They don't exist anymore. And then being like, oh wait, no, they definitely still exist. Um, Who do they exist for? Um, that's way too complicated of a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, okay, I mean, how, uh, how do they exist in your f framework and through your lens? Huh, how do they exist? Well, I mean, I think the, 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 the biggest one, I think, you know, and this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, sort of having a frustration of like, thinking of myself as an artist and going into the studio and making what I think of as art and then being like, oh wait, the rest of the world sees this as music and I'm a musician, oh shit. Uh, how do I fix this? Um, um, like, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, again, I'll just, I'll repeat myself again. I think like, you know, going off this principle of Marina, like taking this work and deciding where you want it to be in the world and seeing if you can actually find that place. Inventing context. Yeah, inventing yeah. the context for it. Um, at the same time, I do think that there's a matter of like, I don't know, 
recognizing on a practical sense the the very different economies of music and visual art. I mean, this is something that, you know, it's sort of an unsexy topic, but it's a very important one. Um, they operate in very different ways, practically speaking. You know, I mean, I and it's and it's, you know, kind of remarkable that, you know, a project such as this one that you've produced is happening in the midst of like such an enormously kind of market driven uh, part of, you know, the geographical art world in New York. Um, and, you know, that's fine. I mean, like, I'm not, I'm not shitting on that at all, but it's, it's, um, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's sort <laughs> of a, it's a very rarefied <laughs> circumstance. Um, so yeah, I don't know, but that's sort of the unanswerable question. I mean, it's like, yes, those, yes, these, these respective categories exist. Yes, there is precedent for people that have navigated between them successfully and unsuc unsuccessfully. Um, but it's, I also think that it's not unique to like making artwork with sound or, or performance or whatever. Like I think it generally speaking as an artist, you have to kind of make, you have to find the context in which you want to work regardless of the medium that you're working in. But it's even more the case if you're doing something which isn't sort of easily packaged. Absolutely. Um, let's listen to some more stuff. Okay. Um, I think, um, I mean, I think I've said the most of the important things that I wanted to say. So cool. I want to end uh, with, you know, I talked a lot about uh, working with uh, Kristen Oppenheim. So I'm going to say a little bit about her and then play one of her pieces. Beautiful. Um, she's also a New York based artist. Um, I came across her work, I think, maybe when I was a freshman in college, just like perusing Ubu Web one night in my dorm room. And, you know, it was like immediately struck by it. And for years, I would put it on mixes and stuff for friends. And anyone I showed it to really loved it. But I didn't know anything about it. And then maybe in 2014 or something, I walked into the new museum. And there was in the, in the, the big main gallery and the and, and like the first floor or second floor or whatever, uh, one of her pieces was playing in, in the space with the Felix Gonzalez Torres piece. And I was like, oh my god, like this is, I didn't realize she was like, like an artist, you know? I didn't know that this was what this work was. I just thought that these were like some funny tape recordings that someone had made. Um, and years later, I, I happened to, you know, to meet her and sort of learn what her story is making this work, which she made, she still makes today, but she was really making a lot throughout the 1990s. Um, and there are these really sort of enigmatic, striking, uh, like acapella uh, installations, which really come from a sculptural sensibility. There's no beginning or end. When they're installed, it should be a piece that plays continuously for the duration of the exhibition. Um, uh, and you know that was sort of an interesting question, talking about putting them on records, because it was like, well, there's no length to these. So we decided that the determining factor would be that we'll put two tracks on each side of a record, and that will be the length. You know, you know, in kind of classic conceptual art record, it's like this is what the medium can facilitate. So we'll allow that to dictate the rules of how we approach this, as opposed to somebody somebody's taste kind of dictating that. Um, so I'll put this on and I guess that will be the end because again, it doesn't really have a beginning or end. So then we should probably sp speak to the fact that in the beginning, before we were talking, as people were coming in, you were playing, uh, work by Niall. Yeah. Niall Cotting and Azuma Matsumoto. Right. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly say something about that. And that record is the last one that came out. Uh, the record is called Remain Calm and this is a, um, a piece that's, I mean, I could, I could, I could spend an hour just talking about this piece alone. It's like such a mind-blowing artwork, and I find myself, you know, thinking, having new thoughts about it constantly. The, um, the first time you saw it was when we were in Zurich yeah, together. Yeah, that's right. We got invited to Zurich Art Weekend to do like some kind of reportage. You know, as radio producers, we were invited there um, with our friend uh, Nina Kettiger, um, who also produces radio in Berlin. And I had met Niall in Berlin, and I saw this piece and was really floored by it. It seemed to kind of touch on so many unarticulable but very pertinent issues about kind of contemporary life, you know, living in kind of a constant state of catastrophe, but in a very kind of regimented and, sur and surveilled style. But there was such an incredible lightness to the work. And it's sort of a cinegraphic performance work. So in this case, it was a very large kind of Kunsthal style space. Um, and there were performers doing things, but you were clearly not supposed to watch them. They were not, you know, they were sort of atmospheric, if you could say that. Um, and there was this unbelievable soundtrack by uh, composer Nozomo Matsumoto, who Niall's been friends and collaborator with since they were in school together in Japan. And um, 
the original soundtrack is actually 72 hours long. Um, so, you know, I spent many long walks, like, listening to, I eventually listened to the whole thing, but it took a long time. And On a European data plan? Uh, <laughs> no way. I downloaded it before. Oh, I okay. Walk, Jesus. Yeah, yeah Aldi Talk was not going to cover that. Um, but um, I, I was sort of, I thought, wow, this is going to be such a long process to figure out how to make this into, like, a one, a single record. But... Somehow they're just they're just truly magicians. Like I don't understand how they do both of them. They they are so 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 skilled at what they do. And I said, okay, well, how do we th approach this? And they thought, well, we want to really we like the idea of a catalog, so we really really want to emphasize that. And I think it was like two days. Nozomu sent me the record, and I listened to it. I was like, this is phenomenal. I can't. I don't even know how I would begin to have feedback of this. You know, it's amazing. And that's what we heard when we were coming in. Um, and you know, I would speak more about that for the sake of time. Actually, Boomcat wrote like a really phenomenal review that I felt like really hit the nail on the head. So if you want to learn more about it, I recommend going there. We'll post there. it. We'll post it in the. We'll post it. In yeah. the links. Um, yeah, they really got it, and articulated it better than I mean. I had interviewed Niall, and we had talked about it extensively, but s whoever the writer was on that one like articulated it better than I ever actually could. Um, but anyways, going back to Kristen, yeah, I mean, they're they're beautiful works. Um, I know Kristen will be here tomorrow, so you can meet her if you want to. Um, and yeah, she she shows at 303 in New York. She had a show up this summer of, of uh, work that's sort of a similar nature to this. Um, so I'll play this. This is a work that I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is from 1993 um, called She Was Long Gone. And uh, yeah, we'll leave it with this. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. You're all welcome throughout the month to come and participate as you'd will. And thanks. Thanks, Reese. Thank you all for coming.
She was blind.